So, picture medium body. I will show you something of which you may ask yourself what has this to do with our, with our theme tonight. It is an illustration of a legend which we know from ancient Greece. If you were a Greek tourist in Hellenistic and Roman times, you were supposed to visit a place in Corinth where Pliny the Elder says painting was invented. This was a wall in Turint where one could see the outlining of a shadow. And this legend is that a girl in Corinth, there is a parallel uh, solution for sculpture also, which I leave out now. A girl in Corinth, in Corinth, in Greece, in Peloponnesus, traced the lines of her beloved when he left her to go to war. And so up to today, one can see this is, this was of course not true, but it's interesting. This is the beginning of picture making, namely tracing the shadow of the body. And this is another example. That of course, this is not preserved, uh, but uh, it inspired many interesting, and for me, the, the most important thing is here, you need a body which projects it, its own image, its own picture, namely the shadow. But the body is not enough. You need the wall, the medium, to trace the fleeting image of the shadow, which cannot be preserved because it changes all the time, in order to fix the image on a material medium. So then you have the image. So in this legend, I like this kind of metaphors. In this legend, you have my three components together, medium, image, body. And of course, this is a photograph by Gerhard Richter, by the way. You see that uh, the body produces images itself, which are body-like, but very different from the body itself, because they have a different substance, they are flat, they are dark, and so on. And here there is, are two archetypal situations of people who look at pictures. They discover that pictures already exist before they do pictures. Namely, on the one hand, the shadow, and on the other hand, of course, the mirror, the mirror of the water. So in both cases, human beings are seeing images which they did not do, which they found as existent before, and which, of course, uh, uh, may have been, it's not recorded in any way, it's just an idea, a thought, which play a certain part in the history of picture making. And of course, Dante, Dante's central uh, theory of the dead in the underworld, in the Hades, are that um, they are shadows, living shadows of the, of the living. And here I rec recommend a wonderful um, video broadcast for the British TV, BBC, uh, a TV Dante, in which he brings, so to speak, the whole shadow theory to an aesthetics of the TV. So this was images of the body, which the body produces, images which, you, which we produce, fabricate from the body. A second instance, you know, this is uh, Jeremy Bentham, by the way, <laughs> the uh, very important uh, British uh, inventor of the uh, panoptico, not panoptico, 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 panoptico. And he, by his last will, he said, I want my corpse to be mummified and to be present to all sessions of the academy. So, he replaces his body by an image, with, which is doll-like, which would have uh, philosophers horrified because his aesthetic did lack completely. So there is this relation between that and replacement by a picture. This is my second. 
now the famous case of the British kings and queens, which um, had a, a doll a replacing body for the time between the one king died and the other king was crowned. There was an interregnum. In this interregnum, they used the image against the body of the living, of course, also against the body of the dead. So there is a whole region of image and death, which I want just to allude with a few examples. And now the interesting thing, you, you, have, you know this from my book, Im uh, Anthropology of the Image. For me, the most fascinating is prehistoric, neolithic uh, practice of taking the skull from which the flesh has receded and applying on the real skull the face again by plaster and collar. So they really replaces the one by the other, the dead by the image. And then they did what I think is the most revolutionary invention of images of all types, never, never surpassed by any other invention, namely the mask. The mask uh, which they put on the, the dead and so on, the mask has this double evidence of presence and absence. The mask shows what it um, covers up, or what is it, what it, pardon me? Hides. What it hides. It shows what it hides. And I think it's brilliant. How could prehistoric people invent such a paradox, which has both possibilities in one, shifting from one to another appearance? So there is this long history where the body was transformed into a mask, replaced by a mask which was present and absent and all that. And then, of course, the Greek theater began from this, when the cult of the dead was transferred on the stage. So you have the Greek actors, they acted with a mask, never with their face. And more than that, the Greek language has no separate words for face and mask. They are both called presbrosopon. So there is this shifting, challenging situation between and the other, which for me at least is fascinating. The, the Latins have, of course, imago, persona, facies, vultus. They are law people, the Romans. They, they wanted to have everything. But uh, the persona is also interesting because the actor speaks persona through the mask. So there is this whole relation between the body on the one hand and the replace and the transformation of the body by pictures. Now these are all very old and elementary things. But in my view, our relation, our mental disposition to images and pictures never loses such elementary experiences. There are also, of course, other things where the body has external representation. The whole history of ornament, as you can see. So I just show pictures. We can come back in the discussion. I don't want to prolong this session. Here you see the German sculptor Balkenhol with a friend of mine. And I just show you this picture without commenting it. Just look at it. Or oh, what you see all the time here, Shatame in America, that there is somebody speaking, and in the same room there is a huge uh, picture. Everybody looks at the picture, though he is present. So here, this is a very interesting. So I hope the fascination of the situation the picture itself saves me from making a big speech. And then, of course, the medium is a very interesting um, situation, which even led to artists of the 17th century, like in this case, Geisbrecht, to represent, to paint a picture from behind, a painting from behind. 
So it is no painting from behind. There is only one picture, and this is showing only its medium. And Parmigiani, who has a pre perverted mirror of a barber shop, Vasari, or old Vasari, says Parmigianino, the young Parmigianino with 23, in, in painted a picture which seemed to be the mirror in a barber shop. With completely, so he represented, so to speak, his media condition. And here the old Bernard Berenson in front of a Dürer portrait. But he doesn't look at the portrait. He doesn't look at the picture. He just looks at the colors it's used. He only uses, he only looks at the medium. He forgets at this moment the picture. He's not interested in the picture. So you see, these are ambivalent situations, <laughs> ambiguous. And here you see myself in front of Murillo. And this is, uh, I asked somebody to photograph me because then I see there is something, what is happening between the one and the other instance. So if you want an explanation, I can try in the discussion. But I just showed. Now, I will end with um, one of my, which you know from the introduction to the English edition, and um, which is one of my favorite examples. This is Tam Jun Peck, his TV Buddha, from 1974. I think I have uh, written <coughs> five pieces about the same picture, and I think it still fascinates me. So the main thing is you have a picture of the same figure of Buddha here and Buddha there, and it's, of course, a short circuit situation, but it um, puts the whole idea where the image is, the Buddha statue or on the TV, into question and has, is a great, one of the great philosophical statements which we possess from 20th century art. And it reacts to the l'instantanéité de l'image of the early TV speaker. You see here a edition of the Cahiers du Cinéma for 1960 uh, with the title La Mutique du Direct. And so Pike in 74 reacts to the new TV situation. And then he sits himself in front of the TV. But I will finish with this picture which uh, for me, summarizes a whole transcultural situation in which we are today, some decades before. In 1975, Namjoon Paik, the father of video art, art, did an installation in the Cologne Kunstverein in which he put his TV Buddha and the Rodin thinker in the back side by side, and he sits between the TV Buddha, the Buddha picture on the one hand, in the foreground, and the famous thinker of Rodin in Paris in the background. And he makes a gesture of Rodin, but behind the Buddha. So he leaves open the question, is he more from Asia? Is he more Buddha-like? Or, is he more, or has he a modernized Western thinker? So what do we see? This is an installation which is also a performance and one of those great, uh, those great um, statements of uh, uh, Namjoon Paik, which I admire very much because this is a whole book or several books in one, in one, in one installation of our presence time today. Thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Professor Belting, for not only being with us in a simple presence, but also <laughs> <laughs> of discussing with us this very intense modality of being present, which is the image. I'm sure that after this uh, very dense and complex uh, theoretical presentation of uh, Professor Belting, and also after us being exposed to the fascinating power of the images, we have a lot uh, to say and to ask uh, Professor Belting. So first of all, I wanted to share Lachazar Boyajiev, the main actor of this session, who organized and planned together with Vladia Mikhailov um, uh, this uh, forum, that I I would like also to remind uh, the reasons of my metaphor about the belting decade. Maybe there was a very strong personal reason behind, because the discussions which we have today and which will happen in April in uh, December are only the continuation of a decade-long uh, reading and discussion around the text of uh, Professor Belting. Uh, first, I remember that in 2001, there was a book uh, called um, Post Histories of Art, clearly influenced by a very famous and debated earlier book of Hans Belting, which is The, the End of Art History, question mark, and which was uh, introducing, uh, which was presenting translation of his texts, I think, for the first time in Bulgarian. And these um, texts were uh, discussed in detail in, for instance, the uh, cultural studies program of uh, Sofia University, where um, in the meantime, we saw many of our students becoming young uh, art theorists and cultural scholars, which will be also active in the panel tomorrow and in the April session. In the same period, personally, I was trying to reflect on images, but from another point of view, which was what I was calling philosophy of images, as philosopher, of course. And um, uh, which is Arboyajiev reminded uh, one of the books which I published in this period, uh, the unimaginable essays in, in philosophy of image, which uh, was published in Bulgarian in 2003. And I just remind you that this was the period in which we were also lecturing in parallel with uh, Professor Belting in Paris, but he was, he was having the chair in Collège de France, where I saw uh, some of our common um, French colleagues like Jean-Pierre Vernon, Jean-Luc Nancy, Georges Diou Berman. And I just remind, uh, to, the, to the audience, these, these authors were very much present in this debate, which was introduced through uh, uh, Hans Belting's uh, works, especially the work of uh, the French anthropologists who visited also Sophie in 2003, at the age of 90, uh, Jean-Pierre Vernon, whose book Myth and Thought in the Ancient Greeks was is including the two uh, famous essays on the origins of representation. So I was very touched that you called uh, Jean-Pierre Vernon your, your master. Uh, I think this is uh, an act of uh, um, intellectual um, um, uh, strong uh, solidarity and also a honor to someone who inspired uh, all of us. So <clears throat> there was also a local debate on the post histories of images animated by our colleagues, unfortunately absent for very pragmatic reasons. They are not in Sofia, uh, Angel Angelov and Irina Gyanova. I just wanted to mention uh, these names because somehow they were the first who introduced the work of Professor Belting in our academic uh, community. Now, if you allow me, I will try, as a philosopher, to introduce a few uh, points of interest uh, for my work and also to uh, formulate maybe uh, two questions. Uh, first of all, the project of uh, Hans Belting of Anthropology of Images, which is so much debate and discussed uh, in many fields as a true um, 
transdisciplinary uh, project which is not cannibalistic at all, but which is opening new space and new bridges between disciplines, is also um, po formulating a crucial um, questions for the philosophy of art, or it's really provoking a reaction. And I'm really glad that some of the important philosophers of our time, like uh, Jean-Luc Nancy and, and uh, other, especially French philosophers, have already uh, reacted um, um, with uh, important texts to his proposals. For me, what was uh, striking in uh, Professor Belting's uh, proposals, and which I think is something which is really different from uh, the perspective proposed by Jean-Pierre Vernon was his interest not that much in the substance of images, but in their modalities, in the way they were operating. Uh, the anthropology of images is very clear about this. Professor Belting is firstly interested not in the question of what image is, but in the question how image is operating. I would allow uh, to reformulate this question in uh, the following way, how does image work? This, uh, I, I found this uh, proposal of thinking images as genuinely philosophical. It's very interesting that uh, just before the lecture started, Professor Belting, uh, of course, uh, joking, reminded me that Madame de Stal wrote precisely two centuries ago that she was the one who introduced uh, German Romanticism and German classical philosophy in France, that she was saying that even if uh, the German uh, thinkers are so speculative and so powerfully thinking um, at the questions of imagination and images, they don't have much practice in seeing images, of looking at images. So I think that uh, from this point of view, it's really fascinating to see how somehow coming from the field of practice of images, of history of art, someone who has worked on images arrives to a very, I would call it in a way philosophical perspective of thinking how image works. Um, in, in philosophy, there were um, uh, classical philosophers like uh, Spinoza or Leibniz who were formulating in a, in a similar manner the question uh, of body. For instance, Spinoza was saying that he's not interested in the question of what body is, but what body can do. Or Leibniz was asking on his turn, how can body act? I think this proposal to think images of Hans Belting is in, in a way typologically close to this perspective. So I allowed myself to uh, oppose two ways of approaching body or image. One would be the substantialist, substantial, which is uh, uh, um, related, of course, to the question what, and the other I would risk to call model approach, uh, which is uh, related to the question of the modality of operating of the, on the question, to the question how. And I think that this uh, model approach is a philosophical approach in the strong uh, sense of this word. Therefore, <clears throat> I'll try to relate this proposal to first to a philosophical issue and category which is, was very present in this evening's presentation and which was very present in what we just saw and which was also very present through the examples coming from Chinese culture, which uh, in a way relativize what we think of images through our Euro-centric perspective, or I would say Western-centric, which is the legacy of monotheistic, the three big monotheistic religions. And of course, this question relates to the question of imagination. Um, Professor Belting made a very strong point on one concept which was translated at least in English as animation, the concept of animation, the forced 
of animation, hmm, which is, in a way, putting the image in action, or which makes the image work. Uh, Professor Belting called this force of animation a uh, universal quality and necessity. I just, uh, en passant, like French, say, uh, I just want to mention that here we have a series of a very strong philosophical concepts, which are the concepts of force, of animation, of universality, universal quality, and necessity. And in a way, this register of this course reminds me at least of a possibility of reading Immanuel Kant's thesis on of the question of, of the concept of imagination, Einbildungskraft. Hmm? There is craft, uh, there is a, a question of force, of power, which is implied in the German term of imagination. I unfortunately I have a quote from Kant in Bulgarian, but Kant uses the term animate, animate in his definition of what he calls aesthetical idea, uh, saying that um, the aesthetical idea, which is of course related to um, aesthetical experience, is related to the capacity of human mind to think many unexpressible things, things which cannot be expressed through logos, through discourse, and in that way, it anim animates the mental faculty, or maybe Professor Belting would say mental images. Uh, I don't want at all to Kantianize Professor Belting, and he, by the way, is very critical to some neo-Kantian thinkers like Ernst Cassirer, but I think in a deep, profound philosophical uh, level, there is a possibility to um, relate and to think further Kantian concepts through uh, the professors of Hans Belting. Just uh, as a brackets, because I mentioned the, the Chinese uh, perspective and how does it relate to my question? Uh, the Chinese sign for imagination is the same as elephant, which is fascinating in itself already. But, and I can imagine you all could imagine what is the reason for it. And the reason is a very famous fairy tale which all of you know. This is the fairy tale about the blind people who were trying to find out what an elephant is. So in a way, they were trying to express their, their, their mental images by describing it as a colon or as, I don't remember, as a robe, I think, the ones who were touching the nose of the elephant. So this is the question about, the, about imagination. And I'll, allow myself a second uh, question or commentary. This is not necessarily a question. This is a possibility for uh, discussion. The second one is related to um, a question or to a concept which is very important for my work, and therefore I'm very curious about how uh, Professor Belting is treating of this uh, concept in relation to this uh, extremely powerful triad between body, image, and medium he's tracing. Um, this is the, um, the concept of technique. Of technique, also going back, of course, to the Greek concept of techne. Um, if medium is, in a way, analogous for the image to, uh, the relation of, between image and medium is in a way analogous to the relation between body and matter. This is, um, I could quote here, Professor Belting, and he's saying, what in the realm of bodies and objects is there matter? In the world of picture is there medium? Uh, so there is a poss possibility to make this analog analogy between mat matter, body, and medium of, of image. I'm, I would be also interested in uh, the question of technique as precisely as a way to animate a given modality 
of the image. A technique not only as uh, this kind of normative aesthetic category, but as a sort of potentia, as potential, which is getting animated or actualized through in the practice of image making. And for instance, in this image which we saw, uh, re uh, putting in an image the, um, the myth told by Plinius about the birth of image, of course we needed the body, the shadow, and the wall, but also we needed the invention of a technique which traces the contours of the body. So I, I'll be interested in how the technique operate in, in this uh, triad. Of course, you were writing a lot about technique and, and media, but in, especially in relation to this theoretical model. I, I, I won't formulate here big hypothesis. I, I have tried to work around this category in my, in my books. Just maybe a, a very simple a proposal that I was trying to think of something like an imminent techniques of, of, let's say, of images. There are not only images and media, but there are some uh, imminent technical potentials which are present in every modality of image producing. And uh, maybe these imminent techniques are what allows for image to find the medium, but also to transgress a former medium and to invent a new. And here I remind you the contested, of course, uh, Walter Benjamin's thesis from his essay on the origins of the work of, uh, on the, sorry, on the work of art in the age of its uh, technical reprodu reproductibility, where he says that, for instance, um, the development of realist painting was making it possible to look for the new media of photography. So it was making possible to look for a certain direction of uh, technical inventions. Therefore, it, this uh, development of a technique imminent to a certain pictorial style led to a technical invention which in uh, its own turn influenced the uh, development of um, uh, representative modalities because once Photo photography was there, art was, uh, according to Benjamin, artists were not feeling bound to the limits of, let's say, uh, realistic uh, representation of reality, so they could move towards uh, whatever, non-figurative even, um, experiments. And in this, in this uh, direction, I have uh, a last question, and this question is rather a provo provocation, uh, because it is, in a way, related to uh, the images we saw, which were extremely powerful, uh, especially Nam Jung Paik's image, but also related to this uh, Chinese uh, uh, story about the elephant. I was asking myself, and by the way, I asked this question also our colleague Angel Angel um, a year ago. If uh, image is related to or if we defined image through this connection of a medium and uh, animated mental image, is there a visual limit of the thought on image? I mean, in contemporary art, we have many examples of works of art which exploit other sensual experiences, other fields of sensual experience. So my uh, question to Professor Beltiki would be, is his theory only limited to visual images, or and can we speak of non-visual images? And of course, there are a lot of theoretical consequences of this. But thinking of the Japanese, of, sorry, of the Chinese um, um, story about the elephant and the various type of uh, representing a mental image, we could maybe extend it to a non-visual, let's say non, um, um, scopocentric uh, ways of representation.
Thank you very much. I was very much intrigued by the remarks which you made about these three interesting concepts and about your own research on technology and techne and in a different way. I, w I try to be as short as possible. First question, imagination. Now, Kant, uh, great connection in this <laughs> uh, relation, wrote not in English or in French, but in German. And German imagination is Einbildung. And Einbildung is untranslatable. That means you are um, appropriating, you are introducing an image. The image becomes part of the body. So the image um, is internalized. And uh, it is very interesting that uh, the image in Einbildungskraft, it is, a, it is of course, a, this uh, um, a contrast. Because on the one hand, Einbildung, on the other hand, force means producing images. Now we have a second use of the Einbildung in German, which is arrogance. So Einbildung has a positive uh, connotation in German and also a very negative connotation. How come? I just thought maybe because the persons which are arrogant have a wrong image of themselves. <laughs> so therefore they are to What's reproach. Pardon me? What's wrong with being arrogant? Maybe nothing, but it is used in that term uh, as oh, negative. Well, it's you, it's you, negative. You Thank you. But you know, I don't say that arrogant is bad. I said that arrogant is used to be bad. Okay. People say it's bad. So Einbildung has opened a lot of, of connotations for me. The second is uh, about technique. And, um, you know, we are usually talking about techniques of image production, techniques of media and all that, but there are also techniques of perception, techniques of using. And one of my favorite examples in this way is an old Egyptian ritual, which is very telling, a very telling example. This is a so-called mouth-opening ritual. With other words, the old Egyptians, they made statues of the gods in the still studio of a sculptor. And then a priest came and animated this statue that the mouth was open, that she was looking alive and as she was speaking. So what in all other situations is an inborn capacity, namely animation, in old Egyptian ritual was a technique, and a separate technique to make a lifeless image looking alive. And this is such an archaic situation that from this we can contrast all. But this, it goes further. From the sculptor studio, the Bible took its inspiration with the, with the narrative of the creation because God formed Adam with clay and all that and then he was blowing the soul into this. This is exactly the old Egyptian situation for making pictures. So if we um, see that this is a technique which we all um, have, and so I think that um, technique has, as you mentioned, a much larger meaning than we usually use it. And the third question, whether I think that images have to be all visual, the answer is no. But how come? Um, I would just again tell a story. 
When I wrote this book, Baghdad and Florence, I was confronted with uh, Arab scientists, Ibn al haytham for instance. And we all think that images are interdicted in Islam. But he has a completely different explanation. He says, I can measure visual impressions which enter the eye and I can see the geometry of light rays and all that. But then they go into the brain and I cannot measure the brain. So images for him are substantially always non-visual. They exist in the brain and therefore cannot be represented. And this is a very charming and sympathetic explanation why you, whereas the um, Renaissance in Florence did the opposite move in saying, I will now represent in an external picture what you see in the brain. So there are two absolutely opposite answers by the Florentines and by the Arabs of the same question that images indeed are oscillating. You have to make it them visible, but they can also be like in dreams, where they're also visual. Now, the real, the real problem is where does the visual end? Where it does it begin? And I think philosophy, if I may say so, has to learn that visuality is a much more broader concept than just the visible, the visual. And the, the visual is, I think, I would say, in order to use the terminology, the visual is what you make visible. But the visible is just not only an external, uh, but you know, if you go to the world of metaphors and so on, the visual exists in language. It exists in thinking. And there, I think, we have to ask ourselves when we talk about our thinking and about our life experience, where the visual begins and where it ends. Thank you very much. You mentioned that iconoclasm on the internet is impossible. Am I quoting yeah, right? I, oh, I know. <laughs> Explain, uh, please, to me. How okay, well, possible? internet started as an iconoclastic thing yeah. because the, you couldn't find an image unless you filed it by, with a word. So the word has a definitive superiority over the image. Nowadays, there are search engines that can look for, for, for images specifically, but, the only, uh, but um, you can actually re reverse the state of uh, internet back to iconoclasm. You only need to introduce a virus in a search engine for images, and then it, it goes back to its initial state. So this is the, hmm, I was thinking that maybe um, a search engine for, for, for images specifically on the internet is something that um, it illustrates the how that Boyan Manchev was uh, mentioning, the how. You, you, punch, you, you punch on the keyboard certain words, and the search engine is guessing your mental image. And then it, it's producing results. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> and I would like to ask, because you said that contemporary art is far ahead in um, trying to, to see the other, uh, um, let's say, cultures or to, to show different pictures of the world. Um, in what way and how you distinguish, what is the art part in contemporary art since uh, the art generally as a specific autonomous activity um, already um, has, doesn't have this meaning as, as before? So what, what's, what's the art part in contemporary art which is specific as a medium uh, or do you think that it's a medium and how, uh, why you said, um, can you tell more than why contemporary art is far ahead in um, um, making or uh, these transcultural dialogues? 
Well, at least uh, there is this uh, discussion about contemporary art. That was my remark. Not about contemporary art itself, but there is a discussion of transcultural art history, which I mentioned. But uh, I would say there are new participants in contemporary art in the last 20 years. Participants from part of the world which we did not exhibit. But what happens is there is a kind of secret battle that if we re exhibit those other works, there is a problem. Are we the ones who are again showing what art is and how art works? So I think it's very interesting. I would say, because this we can discuss tomorrow afternoon, when I talk about the global contemporary. But what I would say provisionally is there are new participants in the game, what we are doing with them. Yes. Thank you very much. I think um, we, since the tomorrow panels were mentioned, we I'll perhaps give the floor to Olojizar to make the announcements for tomorrow's sessions, but before that, I'm sure that uh, tonight we leave an important moment for various disciplines in Bulgarian humanities and starting from Byzantine studies going to philosophy and also for contemporary art in Bulgaria, for which I would like to very warmly thank you, Professor Hans Belting. Thank you very much.